tuning in today, everyone. I just want to let you know my book is out and available on Amazon and Barnes & Noble. The name is Parents Are Greatest Teachers. And now, back to our episode. Hello everyone, this is your host Alex Valgood and this is Leap of Health. And today we have Andrea Schumann Arevalo. She's a trained Ayurvedic practitioner, master herbalist. She's a body worker also, and she's the founder of Microdrops. Uh, she studied at the California College of Ayurveda in 2007 to 2010. And she did her postgraduate work in fertility and post -pass Partum care. Uh, so welcome, Andrea. This is so exciting because we're going to be talking about uh, psychedelics today, which is a huge, huge, huge uh, topic. So thank you. Thank you for being here today. I'm super excited. And uh, so before we go into this whole amazing topic, tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got to be the CEO of Microdrops. Yeah, thanks, Alex, and thanks for having me here. It's really exciting. Um, so I have, uh, you know, I've had quite a journey myself. I've helped a lot of other people on their journeys, but I've never had a more enriching space or a more humbling space than going through my own really deep mental health journey myself. Um, and I was, I'm a serial entrepreneur. My, my former company is a ghee company. So I um, had a, you know, clarified butter company in the grocery space. And um, during the pandemic, uh, the company really was not able to, you know, keep, keep up. And even just before that, you know, with the way like dairy industry works, I was finding that it was really hard to compete as a small business. And so as a mom who was working a state away from where my company was located, watching my business sort of crumble around me um, and being a solo parent um, at the time, because my partner was working in a different state and I just didn't really have any support. So I was homeschooling and trying to run a business and uh, really watching as I couldn't really control the factors that were um, surrounding me and really wanting to be successful and finding that this company was not a successful company. It couldn't, it couldn't hold up. Um, and just the kind of grief and letting go and the self-judgment, um, all of these things kind of, you know, as well as weaning my, my younger son kind of culminated in a bit of a dark space, um, a space where I really didn't want to talk to anyone. I was super internal. And I didn't recognize as much as I had a specialty in women's health, as much as I had a specialty in hormonal health and postpartum, it took me a while to realize I was experiencing pretty severe weaning depression mm -hmm. and um, hormonal stuff that had just led to, you know, slowly layers and layers and layers had built up of brain fog until it didn't matter that I was a master herbalist with all of this experience in the space. I literally didn't know what to do for myself because I just couldn't think. Um, and so I reached out to a friend uh, who was a naturopath and uh, she really gently reminded me that I had the tools that I am capable of healing. And she gave me some of her own formulas to bust out that brain fog. And as soon as I could think, like as soon as I was like had head above water just a little bit, I was like, okay, I need to do something about this. It's really significant. And I've been aware of the, you know, microdosing space. I've been using psychedelics for myself for a long time. And of course, during the time that I was pregnant and weaning, like that wasn't part of my uh, experience. And I just remembered and say somebody gave me a little bit of a microdose tincture that wasn't very well made, but it, you know, just with one uh, dose of it, I was shocked at how my mood elevated and mm -hmm. I was just, uh, you know, more ready for, for my life. And I had ideas and so it was a space where I started realizing, oh, there's, there's ways to make this practice work better. So I, I de started delving into my kitchen witch formulary, uh, uh, you know, self where I just started getting out. I mean, it looks like it is in the cartoons, getting out bottles of stuff and starting to mix together and see what I can make. And I made some horrible tasting versions that worked really well, but 
were, were not pleasurable whatsoever to take. Um, and I, and I eventually got myself to where I said, okay, I'm going to make something that people like to take. It's going to make their microdosing work better. Um, and it's going to give them actual tangible results. So they don't go running off to get antidepressants because as somebody raised by a mom on 30 years of antidepressants, I definitely did not want to head there. So that was kind of, that's the backstory of how I started developing and getting into this area, but psychedelics have been with me for, you know, longer than most people like to admit, you know, um, you know, for cer certainly my first experience was when I was 14 years old. So it has definitely been part of my life. Um, and one that I don't regret whatsoever. And in fact, I'm really, really, uh, supportive of the use of. That's awesome. I think, uh, uh, you touched on our great point that, you know, psychedelics been around for too long, you know, um, long enough that, you know, all, like all the cultures have some sort of psychedelic that, that they will use within their healing practices. And I think um, somewhere around the road timeline, uh, we have come to demonize these practices because we're we don't know how it really works. Uh, we think it's like for druggies or things like that. And I think having the mindset change and see it as how it is, as how they used to, and they still uh, all these cultures or some of them that still uh, practice. You know, they use it for for healing purposes and and for a greater thing than just you know recreational as we often see it so that's that's really really cool and uh, today I wanted to talk a little bit about the um, kind of uh, cannabis because we see marijuana is just marijuana <laughs> but also uh, it has an uh, it comes within the spectrum of psychedelics also for healing uh, what are some of those uses or how um how are you been working with it uh, for all these years now? Cannabis is a really interesting one because it is both fairly mild in some ways um, when you compare it to the larger body of psychedelics like mushrooms or LSD or ayahuasca. Um, in comparison, it can be very mild you know, in large doses is where you start seeing it as a psychedelic, you know, um, as it were. Um, there's a lot of spaces in which it can be incredibly therapeutic. And just like any substance, any healing substance, um, you know, Ayurveda, we say that like one man's medicine is another man's poison, right? So it's like, it really depends on the person. It depends on the intention. It depends on the usage. You can very easily hide in cannabis and smoke yourself into not experiencing your life. You can also use cannabis to bring your selfness out. You can also use cannabis to kind of suppress the parts of yourself that are being self-sabotaging. Uh, you can also use cannabis for total physiological factors like uh, nausea or, um, you know, working on uh, something from a digestive space uh, or social anxiety. Um, so really it's the how, it's the how much, it's the what are we doing with this? What's, what's our intention behind it that really makes that decision? Are you using this as a place to hide or are you using this as a place to heal? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, one of the many places um, people are starting to explore with cannabis, besides the traditional smoking, you know, of cannabis, um, is also the, the microdosing of cannabis, where, where the purpose of it is not to get high. These are sub-perceptual amounts. You're letting these cannabinoids and these, you know, magical chemicals into your system in very small amounts um, to help relax the nervous system. Like our nervous systems are so keyed up right now. I mean, you just have to look at the news for five minutes before, you know, you feel like you need a Xanax and Xanax aren't good for you. So it's much easier to like, take um, a little bit of cannabis, which is a plant, which is safe, which has been proven over like millennia um, to not be harmful. And, you know, different season, different person, um, people and women and moms are using cannabis all over the place. Um, and we, of course, are, you know, really easily judged for it during certain, you know, times or places in our mothering experience. 
Um, but for many people, they find that the use of cannabis makes them a better parent. So like I said, it's all about the like the how, the why, the intention. We can never divorce an intention from a substance. Yeah, for sure. And with cannabis, uh, I know there's like different components uh, to it, right? There's the cannabinoids and the THD and the, what's the other one? CBD, CBG, CBN, right. There's all sorts of, there's all sorts of chemicals in cannabis. And that's true of all, all plants. Um, You know, I think it's coming into people's awareness because of cannabis, but I don't see cannabis differently than I see ashwagandha, than I see any other healing plant, um, healing fungus, healing anything. They all have multiple components and what we call the entourage effect, meaning when all of the components are taken as a whole, they work together to make the medicine uh, work in a holistic way in the body. Um, it also means that uh, because it has so many components and because science loves tearing things apart to their constituents that we've learned that different pieces of the plant work in different ways and it's Mm -hmm. allowed some people to be able to use portions of the plant without using others you know that might trigger a drug test that might make them alter alter their state so people use cbd um, and then increasingly people have some awareness of cbg cbn uh, CDC, all of which kind of move the, you know, body and nervous system in different directions. And of course the terpenes, um, which are an, a really important and active component of cannabis. Uh, the terpenes are what you smell, uh, when you're smelling cannabis and it smells really good. That means it's got a good kind of terpene, um, amount and people don't often understand that, um, a big part of the uh, medicinal effect of cannabis lies in the terpenes, it's essentially very similar to a type of essential oil kind of, mm-hmm. uh, you know, kind of com- com- component. That's not exactly what they are, but, um, but gives you sort of an idea. Um, so it, it engages the senses. If you can smell it uh, and it smells good to you and to your body and to your brain, it is a good uh, chance that that is a medicinal match for you. So that's great. And, and uh, I like that you mentioned the, all these components and how they're all used for different purposes. I know, I think now in our, these modern times, uh, we hear a lot of uh, CBD. They put CBD in a lot of things because it, uh, it's kind of like the most uh, known like for healing things, right? Uh, you could also use it for your food or blend it on, you know, I know a, a herbalist too that blends CBD with honey for like, you know, just the medicinal uh, side of it. Uh, when you do, uh, when you're talking about the psychedelics, what's the part that you guys use for, for microdosing? Is it a combination of all these different parts of cannabis or is it uh, in a specific one? Um, I'm curious about which one is it because um, first of all, I, I never really saw cannabis as a psychedelic, right? It was more like as a relaxing thing that people either smoked or ate in edibles and things like that. But now uh, reading a little bit more about this is, is very interesting. So um, how, how do you guys eat, um, use it or what part of it is it? Yeah. So, you know, in my, I'll, I'll separate my personal life from my company and that my company doesn't use it uh, currently, although we're coming out with it with a uh, cannabinoid uh, product with CBD and CBN, Um, you know, THC, when we're talking about that, like I tend personally to favor a whole oil, what we call full extract cannabis oil, because I do appreciate the entourage effect um, in cannabis and how things work together. And I'm not afraid of, nobody's going to drug test me. I own my own company. Um, so I'm not afraid of any of those pieces. I also live in Oregon, um, where it's totally legal. Um, and so I'll, I'll, I'll make the caveat that this is not the case for everybody. Um, it's not the case for, you know, so I, I, I would never suggest that you put yourself in harm's way. You know, at the same time, for me, when, when all things are equal and you don't have barriers to your access, I prefer a full extract cannabis oil. And um, I personally um, have, uh, you know, added added full extract cannabis oil to my 
to my routine in small micro doses uh, because I find that it just helps to ground me a little bit. Um, and when I say micro doses, I'm meaning like two to three to four milligrams of THC. This is what we call a sub-perceptual dose. It does not make me high. Um, it chills out my nervous system. If I want to smoke cannabis and I want to experience cannabis more in my, in my body, in my head, in the physiological feelings, I choose to smoke it. I'm a little bit old school. I'm 43 years old. Um, it's usually my, my preference. Um, uh, and I take breaks from it because just like anything, um, when you overuse a substance, it loses some of its power and it needs, um, kind of space to be able to reflect, you know, between, uh, between using, using those substances. So you don't overuse them. So yeah, there's many different ways between eating, uh, smoking, you can vape it. Although I do recommend that people are careful when they choose, uh, vaping, uh, because many companies adulterate and add, uh, things to their cannabis oil, which are not healthy for the body and the system, including like glycols and things that are not nice to smoke, um, on your lungs. Um, and in general, it's a very, it's a fairly accessible plant, even in places where it's illegal. And so, um, you know, if you, if you're a person who feels more comfortable, uh, not being high whatsoever, then you really are looking at a, a product that should be divorced of THC, um, uh, or should include, um, a form of THC that is not activated, uh, such as THCA, um, which doesn't activate and, uh, without, it requires heat to can, can convert to Delta 9, which is actually what makes you high, you know? Mm -hmm. So there are, are ways to take in the whole plant uh, that are not uh, ways that will make you high. And increasingly those are more and more available. CBD is something that also, I mean, I, I will say has become just sort of a buzz product. I mean, mm -hmm. I don't see the need for CBD being in your water any more than I see for the need to like put fluoride in a city water system for, to make somebody's teeth healthy. Um, you know, like I don't, I don't see a need for your lip gloss to have CBD in it. I really don't. Uh, I feel like it's an overuse of the plant and, um, I hate to say for the most part, people are just trying to deal with the fact that they overinvested in the CBD space and uh, people have like, you know, these giant fields of hemp that they know not what to do with because uh, they decided they didn't want to make them into cloth or any number of other totally useful things you can make out of hemp and they wanted to go directly into the supplement space. You know, there is value, there is value there in CBD, but in my opinion, it is like heavily overused right now in the space and quality means everything and amounts mean everything and how you use means everything. Yeah, for sure. And uh, what are some of the uh, components that you use for your microdosing? Like, because uh, you mentioned you're about to start adding some of the cannabis products. Uh, what are some of the ones that you're currently using within uh, yeah. So right now, uh, right now, our three products out do not have any cannabis or cannabinoids um, or any psychedelics whatsoever. They're hundred percent legal. They're about to go on Amazon. So like, just to be very clear, there's that. And then the, um, our, our next products we're going to release uh, we've got a few. Um, we're going to release a version of our micro drops, which are really tasty micro elixirs uh, full of herbs and adaptogens and nootropics, um, which means herbs and mushrooms that are good for the brain. Um, we're going to release versions that also have CBD and then another uh, component, uh, CBN in one of them, CBG in one of them, and CBC in one of them, because my products uh, are meant to move the nervous system in different directions. I've got one that is calming, one that's activating, and one that is good for irritability and focus. Um, and so with that, we chose the cannabinoids that support those aims. And uh, we're putting them in, in forms that are uh, full plant extract forms, uh, but that do not contain any THC so that we can safely sell them uh, through, you know, across state lines, uh, you know, and make them really accessible to people. Um, a lot of the, you can extract CBD from marijuana, but if you do that, you're under a marijuana legislation, so you can't sell those products across state lines, which means we have to get them extracted from hemp um, mm -hmm. when we're doing that. 
And eventually we'll work with a company that has a THC license and license our product through them to be sold through legal channels in individual states um, through legal frameworks. Um, so yeah, we, we're choosing um, CB, CBD, CBN, CBG, and CBC um, as things that we're working to add. Um, and I would say they add value and they add depth to the product that is already highly functional. That's awesome. Uh, for everyone uh, listening, what are cannabinoids? Because I think we 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 have heard a little bit about it, but we're in, we don't know exactly what it is and how they they work. Well, cannabinoids uh, are yes. you know compo components. Uh, you just another word for the chemical components you find within cannabis, cannabis, cannabis. We have. <laughs> now I'm just a little bit. Um, that's we have in our body an endocannabinoid system. So we, mm -hmm. our body is already primed to receive these chemicals um, as part of our hormonal system, as part mm -hmm. of our emotional system, as part of our nervous system um, in kind of adjacent ways. Um, so in a way, these are nature's way of kind of like interacting. So humans have interacted with cannabis for millennia um, with, you know, references going back in ancient Ayurvedic texts, like literally thousand, like 10,000 10, years um, where you, you have, have a history of this being used in uh, people, who, uh, people who's, who were praising Shiva. This was part of Shiva's medicine in India, it's known as Vijaya, which means victory. Um, it is a you know well known medicine, uh, especially in, in Indian in Indian culture, and only been sort of like demonized in the much more modern times. Because of course, anybody looking at a marijuana plant who didn't know what it was couldn't really differentiate it from anything else in their garden. Um, so <laughs> I think that's just the the reality of it. Um, I lost my thread of what you originally asked me as I started yes. talking. <laughs> no, no worries. But you know what? Uh, that makes me think of a little bit of the history of uh, marijuana and, and cannabis because uh, I think it came uh, on our, as you mentioned, it's been used for thousands of years for, for uh, you know, all these old cultures that they use it for medicinal purposes. And uh, and I think in a also modern spiritual time, purposes, and a, you and know, yeah. right. And I think uh, in the modern times, uh, when the cotton industry, if anyone knows a little bit about the cotton industry in our modern times, um, marijuana came to be demonized. Um, I think it was in the 1800s, some, somewhere. Don't quote me on this. Um, look it up yourself. <laughs> but uh, a while, a uh, long time ago, when uh, we will still use marijuana as medicine, uh, the cotton industry came and started demonize and and you know bad uh, propaganda and, and marketing about how it was from the devil and and these and it will you know black people will come and and, and rob your wife and all these craziness pretty much to demonize the the whole. Uh, marijuana industry and then that's when the cotton industry came came uh, to be what it was at that time being that marijuana uh, and all the the plants and the hemp and all that was a better quality it was uh, better to grow better for the environment it was better in all the ways and it just got destroyed by the cotton industry so that you know that tells us a, a little bit about um, you know like Come on, let's let's be open minded. Let's do a little bit of research on uh, where things come from. And so, and yeah, yeah well, and yeah, racism is a really big part. It's a, it's like the part of how marijuana got really demonized. And you know, a bigger the biggest campaign I know of in the early nineteen hundreds of you okay. know, and then like sort of early to mid nineteen hundreds when you get like reefer madness coming out um that short film which is like 
the most hilarious form of propaganda. If you're to watch it now, you're just like, what is going on here? But it's also really clear what was going on there was um, scary Black people. That's what they were trying to say. Black people are scary and they have this thing. Uh, They have this plant Mm -hmm. that, you know, whatever. um, And, you know, specifically looking at like even musicians and people in that space uh, before then the clean white jazz got to come out and like take over this like reef jazz that was going on before so there's a super long history of like racism in uh marijuana and I would say that that actually pervades I hate to be controversial here it pervades the industry today um you know because really like in the reality is that um you still have black people behind bars all over the United States uh, for marijuana related offenses while wealthy white people uh, profit off this industry in to the tune of millions and millions of dollars. Um, and so the one problem didn't get solved before the other thing happened. So it's important that while we look at the history, we also look at the current state of affairs um, and just know that like it's different in every state, but at the same time, we all need to be aware both of our privilege, our access, our dangers um, and uh, really what the medicine is. And all these things are totally different pieces to look at because, you know, the history um, is what the history is. The plant is what the plant is. And ultimately the plant is innocent of all of this. And it's really just people who've been, you know, making a really big deal about trying to control nature and other humans. Yeah, yeah, for sure. That was a um, little uh, small clip of our little history here <laughs> when it comes to um, this type of substances that we're trying to use for healing now in, in our times and trying to bring back what they were uh, used for with uh, our ancestors and the old cultures and all that. And just to be an open-minded a little bit about you know, um, what we're talking about here and just for you to kind of like do your own research and do your own assessments and, you know, psychedelics, um, can be for everyone and not for everyone. So just, uh, do your research. I know, um, I was talking to another expert and, uh, she was mentioning that, you know, like sometimes if you have like heart problems and you're taking medicine for heart problems, maybe psychedelics m- might not be for you. Or if you are bipolar or, or certain uh, psychotic or things like that, maybe this might not be the greatest thing for you to do. So always, you know, be open-minded, uh, do a little bit of research, talk to experts. That's, um, that's probably like the best way to go about it. I like that you mentioned that Ayurveda has used this uh, for the longest time. And um, are you still using um, Ayurveda and cannabis now within yourself or maybe with clients that you might have? So I don't really see clients too much anymore. Um, I do do the occasional one-off, one-on-one microdosing uh, consultation uh, for people. And I focus mostly on mushrooms uh, with that and not um, as much on cannabis. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, personally, I still, I use cannabis. I, like I said, I take breaks um, from it and I try to make, maintain healthy healthy usage and healthy boundaries, which are, you know, I mean, can be and during really stressful times, hard to, hard to keep. So it's, uh, you know, during the pandemic, I definitely smoked more than I like am comfortable with now. So, you know, I have been through the gamut of, of use from completely, uh, recreational to completely medicinal, um, you know, including, you know, including many, um, many uses that are, were definitely not for, um, for purposes of getting high. Um, so, Mm -hmm. so yeah, it's still, it's still in my life in that way. Yeah. And it's important that you mentioned that too, because when we're talking about healing, it's, uh, that's the purpose Like we're, we're talking about here about, uh, we're talking about here about the healing part of this whole, psychedelic uh, process in what the industries are, are, are doing, which is microdosing and not, you know, oh, I'm just going to go get high. It ha- it's like really far from, from that. 
And so, yes. So pretty much, you know. A connection thing here for a moment. Oh, there it is. There you are. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Um, yeah. And you know what? Like, I gotta be honest. I'm, I'm not mad at anybody who wants to get high for a minute. You know what I mean? Like, it's not like, I think it's also important not to like demonize that in any, any way. Um, because we've all been through a lot as a country. And frankly, if you give me the choice between a bottle of wine and a joint, I will tell you that that joint's going to be less harmful on the system. It's going to be, um, you know, more navigable in your regular life and situation. Um, being drunk regularly has super toxic effects on the body, uh, on relationships and all kinds of other things. So like given the choice between the, the self-medication of the two, if that's what people are doing and they do do that, you know, mm -hmm. so people do self-medicate you know, if your choice is, you know, go on, you know, five different psychiatric medications, drink a bottle of wine and yell at your kids or smoke a joint, smoke a joint. You know what I mean? Like the judgment is society's judgment. It shouldn't be yours. You know, that is true. That is true. I think we all, um, uh, cope with, uh, things differently and, and you're right. I mean, we we're talking about earlier about, how um how much damage alcohol has over our bodies how much uh tobacco has you know how damaging it is for our body yet it's it's legal out there right yeah. <laughs> and even on the packaging it says that it might cause cancer or these other things right. so yeah i think uh, uh you're right like definitely liberating ourselves from the judgment and really see what we're putting on our bodies, why we're doing it. And, um, you know, everybody's, uh, works differently for sure. Well, and like, what, what is sobriety is a question because right now, if you actually look at, um, the statistics, you have 70 million plus people on psychiatric medications in the United States. That's more than one in five people. So that's, to me, not sobriety. It literally changes the way your brain functions, the way you relate in relationships, the ability you have to connect or not connect. And I'm not saying because definitely some of your listeners, just statistically, a lot of your listeners will will be on psychiatric medications. There's no demonization of that here. Um, and at the same time, it, it is well known, the American Psychiatric Association is very loud about saying these are overprescribed medications, more than half the people that are on them. And if we're talking about 70 million people, we're talking about over 35 million people on drugs they shouldn't be on. Um, you know, there was a study in translational psychiatry, I believe in 2017, with, that, that studied long-term antidepressant use and showed that people who are on long-term antidepressants, um, that the antidepressants, not the depression itself, that's the title of the article, antidepressants, not depression itself, reduces the empathy to the pain of others. So if you just go ahead and like expand that out to how many people are on drugs that suppress their ability to feel empathy, smoke the joint. If you want to smoke the joint, joints don't do that to you. They don't suppress your ability to, um, you know, to feel empathy to the pain of someone else. You know, when you have an entire population that's on these medications and you wonder why people cannot hear what other people are saying that we're constantly fighting with each other. It's, we have a deep lack of empathy and compassion fatigue in our country. And if we have medications that have been shown to increase this issue, we need to look at the impact to society, you know, whatever countrywide, you know, and then we talk about like, oh, cannabis and like, is it like being high versus, you know, healing ultimately, ultimately you have like a safer choice, even if you are using it recreationally right over here, even if you are choosing to numb, which I am not promoting whatsoever, mm -hmm. right. you know, you can numb permanently or you can numb for 35 minutes, you know, a couple of hours, you know, so it's a, it's a pretty big topic right now, you know? Yeah, for sure. And, uh, that, you know, brings me to the big question that a lot of people that's curious about psychedelics or even uh, cannabis or whatever, um, 
how addictive are this? Um, you know, it's a, this is a really good question. It's also a really hard question to answer with complete certainty. Uh, works differently in the body than nicotine or opiates, um, which create a physical dependence, right? So like uh, nicotine links into your system, creates a physiological dependence, like your body starts Once needing it. it, things, withdrawal mm -hmm. symptoms happen in your cardiovascular system and your nervous system when you start withdrawing from it. Same with alcohol, um, definitely with opiates because of the way um, opiates interact in the brain from some of the first times that you even have opiates in your system and dependence starts being created. Um, with marijuana, you're looking more like psychological dependence. So getting used to uh, feeling like you can hide behind being high, um, that you can uh, hide behind the comfort of not fully feeling all of your feelings. Those are the type of dependencies that one would worry about when overusing cannabis. Are you using it to reveal yourself and to be at peace with yourself and to heal yourself? Or are you using it to hide from yourself? Once you start using it to hide from yourself, then you can worry about psychological dependence, um, which for sure it is, is a thing for people how about with the microdosing um going to uh mushrooms are those um addictive absolutely they're what they call anti-addictive um you know mushrooms are anti-addictive anybody who's taken a full mushroom trip not a microdose but a full mushroom trip will tell you that that's not the next thing they want to do the day after um you know and if they are choosing to be on like a couple days of a you know, spiritual journey or, or regime, usually it's work to get into that second place. It's maybe something they don't even want initially. So there's no risk of addictive dependence with mushrooms and with microdosing. Um, what uh, people will suggest that you take days off. Um, it's typically suggested with microdosing that you do it no more than five days a week because overuse will create not dependence, but um, tolerance. So that like you, you basically just don't, uh, aren't getting the same effects if you don't take little breaks um, from, from it. So my, when you're talking about cannabis, whether or not cannabis is a psychedelic is heavily debated in the psychedelic space, mm -hmm. but I absolutely know facilitators and therapists that are using, using large dose also as part of like, um, therapy in a really similar way that you mm -hmm. would, um, you know, a psychedelic facilitated session with like mushrooms or LSD or ayahuasca or any number of different things, um, are using it for deep, you know, psychedelic healing. Um, you know, with my, with my, with microdoses of mushrooms, kind of going back to mushrooms, like you're looking at actually interacting with the nervous system in a healing way and not a numbing way. So microdosing, um, a lot of people don't understand that they think it's just like taking mushrooms to get high during your regular uh, you work know, hours. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's not like, that's not what happens. And it's also like not useful you know, to like, I mean, if you're microdosing for, for improving your focus and you take, you know, 500 milligrams of it, that's not going to improve your focus. That's going to have you like kind of running off to play outside maybe and enjoy the grass and the trees and all the things around you. Um, but when we're talking about microdosing, we're typically talking about a window between 50 milligrams, even sometimes 25 milligrams to a max of about 300 milligrams. People will argue with me about that, but I will say that like, that's the, the window that I feel like you're, you're looking at. And for me, the sweet spot with microdosing is definitely a place where I do not feel it in my system as far as being high. It's definitely taken at such a small amount um, that it, it, it's a, it's a medicine. It's a, um, it's a, you know, just like any herb, you know, would be, um, and I think there's also a misunderstanding that there's many, uh, there's many substances that if you take them in large amounts will affect your, um, your mind state. If anybody who's ever taken a large amount of kava knows it makes you feel pretty drunk, um, in its own way, you know, um, makes you feel like definitely altered. Um, and that's perfectly legal. Right. So, um, and it's, and it's got a beautiful lineage of historical use for healing. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, with, with microdosing, um, 
you know, some of its, mo its best effects are really um, in that super sub perceptual category. Yeah. And for all these psychedelics, uh, what's your take on uh, for people to take them? Uh, is it usually better to be, have someone that will coach you through on how to take them and work with you as you're working on your healing? Or is it better to just take it as you wish? Yeah, I really think it depends on the person. I mean, if you're talking to somebody who's used psychedelics like me since they were 14, I didn't require a lot of guidance to play with it, but I also have a lot of years of experience of formulating my own products, using my own body as a lab, playing with things. I'm very comfortable with that. I do not think that is most people. And when it's people who have not um, experienced psychedelics ever, I highly suggest that they see a facilitator. There's places like in Oregon, for instance, Measure 109 passed uh, for therapeutic use of psilocybin. Um, and so we will have le legitimized legal licensed facilitators um, that have gone through a training program who are there to um, help you. Now, for microdosing, Oregon didn't really write in great provisions for microdosing. So most of the therapy is going to be done on a macro level. Um, so you're talking about taking actual full doses of these uh, products as part of your therapy. Um, for microdosing, when you're on your own, this is, this is one of the things that I created my company for. It is hard to figure out what your dose is what you're treating. Um, when you, when you take a mushroom and you expect it to treat depression, anxiety, lack of focus, creativity, flow state, all these things people microdose for, um, they're all different directions. You know, like if you're treating depression, you need to come up. If you're treating anxiety, you need to come down. If you're treating focus, you need to really like get grounded. Right. And so, um, I created my line of products and my company to help people make these things a little more accessible. Um, also creating an app right now to make the dosing and the understanding of how things work um, more accessible and more understandable, more easily trackable. Um, so yeah, I do believe that reaching out to somebody in the space is a super great idea. We're, um, we're building a list of both affiliates and um, a database of practitioners that are friendly to the practice of microdosing, of cannabis use, of all these things so that you don't go into your doctor, I mean, it includes MDs and NDs. Um, so you can go to a doctor that instead of immediately demonizing it because they don't have experience in that area, um, will be able to support the use. Um, and it's especially important to get help if you are on an antidepressant. And like I said, if you're one of 50 million out of those 70 million people in this country, you're on an antidepressant or you're on an anti-anxiety med or you're on um, maybe an ADHD med, especially like something like Adderall, it's absolutely essential that you get a medical professional to help you come down off these products. And you may have to enlist a um, psychedelic professional to help you come up on your microdosing products uh, mm -hmm. or even see if they are um, appropriate for for you and your with your mental health state and it's it is pretty controversial being studied and and it's not 100 understood which conditions um it is okay or not okay for um so because of the ethics of the studies it's hard to bring in people who are bipolar people who have borderline personality disorder people who have like schizophrenia there's there's a lot of uh ethical medical study issues so we don't have a hundred percent all we have is like anecdotal evidence of yeah. how these things work so yeah I, I would say reach out and and you think it's harder than it is but there are actually have been for decades uh on psychedelic practitioners who've been practicing uh these healing thing uh healing methods in the shadows and um they're starting to get to come out into the light and that's just wonderful yeah and even though i like that you mentioned the the research and the ethic research that goes within this whole thing because uh there's two big researchers that that they did for a while which was um the most like i guess friendly if you want to call it that way uh with uh, different diagnosis and it was uh with ptsd which it was for like veterans and stuff like that that was kind of like appropriate to do their research 
because that's like such a big uh, trauma. And the other one was with the woman that's been raped. But, you know, even though it's it's a small um, or it's just like these two specific researches, it gives us a lot of good light into what can be possible and what can psychedelics be used for, you know, when it comes um, to like uh, mental state and all these things. So it, it it's it's great. I, I, I have like a big hope that you know, science will keep doing research and, you know, MDs will be on board to, to treat people with psychedelics because they're more like a lot more friendly than, than the, all this medicine that we, we've been putting people on. That's not very helpful. And that in the small print, it says, you might have thoughts of suicidal. <laughs> well, that's just real, right? But that's also... It's, it, it requires an entire reframe. And the psychedelics might be the first step into how we reframe looking at healing in general, because mm-hmm. like the way that these me- like psychiatric medications are applied, like you mentioned, are, you know, not in a healing way um, necessarily. They are um, more in a numbing or, you know, or blocking way. And then you have like psychedelics. The reason they've been effective is not because they help you hide from your trauma they help you process it and integrate your trauma and what's why it's been so successful i met a group of veterans i went to the a psychedelic medical conference um in toronto um not in toronto in uh queen's college in ontario canada and you know honestly the conversation in canada is really different right now these are it was stocked full of mds and neurosurgeons and uh people like uh with great professional degrees um at researchers it was held at a university um you know we're talking about like major um academic players coming into this space it's quickly becoming much less demonized honestly than cannabis cannabis has a harder road to hoe than uh, psychedelics do right now because Johns Hopkins University is on it, you know, mm-hmm. like uh, universities in, uh, in England. I mean, it's, uh, it's all over the place and the research is great. The veterans that I met told me stories that would make your hair stand on end that they were telling me with love, with deep gratitude for the medicines that they had taken they had tears in their eyes for how transformed they felt by these medicines. They could talk about their trauma. They were not afraid to talk about their trauma. And, and even more so, the compassion, the empathy they exuded um, was incredible to me. One of, the, one of the biggest things I noticed was these men coming around telling us their stories and then, and then saying, I want to hear about what you've been through. It doesn't matter to me that you weren't in battle. It doesn't matter to me that you're minimizing your own pain and trauma. And they would say, everyone in this world has trauma. And mine, because it is, you know, was more in, intense in this way, doesn't mean it was more intense to my body because the to the body trauma is trauma. Mm-hmm. To the mind trauma is trauma. Um, you know, some horrible thing that your mom said to you when you were five is trauma, you know, um, you know, they were in battle trauma, right? But that doesn't mean that we all don't get to acknowledge, uh, understand, and go through the healing process with our own. And that was the biggest message I got from these, these gentlemen who like, you know, there's big soldiers, they're like walking in with just like hearts that were just like shining. And it, it gave me a lot of, um, like just a great deal of respect, you know, both for the people who are willing to face themselves in these ways um, and, uh, and for the, the researchers that are spending the time uh, working on understanding uh, what these medicines do long overdue. Yeah, that's, that's incredible because, you know, like uh, as the communities, as the culture, we sometimes were like so afraid of these uh, psychedelics because when they've been demonized for so long, then now we need all these proof to make it, you know, like right, like understandable in our heads, you know, like, oh, okay, now they're doing research. Oh, now they're doing this. Science is telling us it, they work. 
they are good for us, you know, for all these individuals, for all these situations. So um, I'm, I'm so excited and I can't wait to, to go to that one next year if they have one. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, they're, they're um, actually Sisters in Psychedelics is coming up in, um, in BC, Canada, and British Columbia on, uh, I want to say in September of this year, so just in a couple months. It'll be like small but awesome, uh, really focusing on women in psychedelics in Canada. Canada is really leading the way in this space right now, um, you know, and, and it, the conversations are real different up there, like I said. But um, yeah, and then MAPS, uh, the multidisciplinary institute have I, I always forget the actual like look up maps psychedelics yes. the uh, acronym evades me um anyway they're having in 2023 a really big gathering in Colorado um this year in November there'll be the second gathering in called Wonderland in Miami in fact it's actually just coming into public consciousness so if you're a person like a person who's new to this and you're listening and you're just interested, you can look up what's the psychedelics conference near me. And if it's something you're nervous about, not so sure about, like go meet and talk to these people. You'll find incredibly normal humans. And one of my favorite things is finding like really experienced doctors who get vulnerable and tell you about their macro, their macro journeys and like, you know, businessmen on the stage talking about how they used to mistreat their wives and they don't do it anymore. It's like the conversations even being had in business are so exciting. So like I invite people to step in and learn and be part of, um, you know, the psychedelic renaissance that's happening now because it's a beautiful thing. Yeah, for sure. For anybody that's listening, MAPS, it's a great one. That's actually how I found that about uh, psychedelics. So reading uh, their articles and all the research and study that they're doing, it's it's such a great work for humanity itself. So it's, it's, it's awesome. So yeah. yeah, for sure. Thank you for being here today. I think this whole conversation, I know went up and down and everywhere, but I think it was just so amazing to, you know, to listen to you and what you have to to say about all these um, industry that's coming up now. So thank you for, for being here today. Is there anything else that you would like to share with us before we go? Um, yeah, I thank you so much for having me on and for giving me the opportunity to speak. And, um, you know, your your listeners will get a discount on my site if they if they choose to come. Um, microdrops.com is spelled with a Y, M-Y-C-R-O-D-R-O-P-S.com. And there you'll find our first products that are just simple herbal and functional mushroom wellness supports, 100% legal. Um, and then we're soon to release the Dose It Yourself microdosing kits, um, which will be uh, also 100% legal, U-B-Y-O-M, bring your own mushrooms. And we give you all of the things that you need to dose and make it accurate and make it um, safe and all of that. So I invite you, uh, I invite you to come over and check it out. Thank you. Thank you. And for anybody that wants to uh, look for you on social media, or if they have uh, another questions uh, in regards to this, where can they find you? We are at Microdrops with a Y, M Y C R O D R O P S on all socials except Pinterest, which it, it, we are, uh, we can be found at We Are Micro, We Are Micro with a Y, M Y C R O. Um, so you can find us on all socials at Microdrops. We look forward to it. And uh, you get $10 off on your first purchase if you use Alex's link, um, okay. which you can share with you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I will be putting all this information on the show notes for everybody that wants to get in touch uh, with our guest today, or if you want to uh, try these products, uh, if you need more information or questions, everything will be on the show notes for you. If you need to find out more about my show, you can go to uh, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, at Alex Valgood. Uh, you can go to my website, alexvalgood.com, and you can find everything that I do there too. Also, don't forget my book is out. It's on Barnes and Nobles and Amazon. You can grab your copy there, read it, leave me a review. Uh, let's keep talking about it. The book it's called Pines Are Greatest Teachers. And uh, thank you again for everyone. Remember, keep your mind open, your ears, everything. Listen, do your research, talk to our experts, and then go from there. Thank you everyone for 
today. Amazing conversation. Thank you. Thank you Have a blessed day. Bye. Thank you.